techniques that we use, uh, but then I'm also going to talk about uh, a, a decision support tool that, we, that we've been working with uh, uh, Eagle on uh, that will hopefully be launched uh, and available sometime uh, later this year. So with that, when we're talking about natural shorelines, um, our conversations always start with what we call the land water. And this is really that place where, where, where the land meets the water. And, you know, this, uh, this, this commonly occurs in wetlands, lakes, rivers, but this land water interface, it's an incredibly important and critical habitat niche. It's very important for both water quality and habitat. And what we see with this niche is it's a very narrow space geographically, but it's incredibly important from a habitat and water quality standpoint, because that's the exact zone where a lot of our plants and animals thrive, especially our wetland uh, plants and animals. They need to pass back and forth between the water and the land. Now, the trick with with that land water interface is that for one, it's it's potentially susceptible or it's incredibly susceptible to erosive forces, but it's also incredibly susceptible to development because people want to develop and live and be near the water, be it in a house, a boat, or a trail, uh, or other way that we use the shoreline. So what we have when we're talking about this land water interface is an area that's incredibly important ecologically and also loved to death uh, and is also very erosive. So that's why uh, this discussion of natural and nature-based features for shoreline restoration is so important is we need to be able to protect and restore these areas uh, for, from the potential harm that, that often comes to them. So what is NNBF? Uh, we, uh, when we when we say NNBF, typically we're saying natural and nature based features. Uh, this term's had a lot of different de uh, ways to describe it over the years: soft shorelines, natural shorelines, green shorelines, living shorelines. Uh, what's becoming the commonly accepted nomenclature is natural and nature based features, and we're seeing that really take hold across the country. And the reason for that is that uh, it, it really does a good job of describing, you know, these aren't purely natural systems often, uh, but, but, we're, but what we're doing is we're trying to utilize natural and nature-based principles to solve these societal problems of flooding and erosion and stormwater. But we wanna do this while maintaining ecological integrity. So what we're doing with these, uh, with these types of solutions or these features is we're hybridizing natural systems with man-made or engineered solutions. Really, and to do this work well, we need to be able to integrate both ecology and engineering to create these systems that are functional, but also ecologically friendly. So they're not purely biological, they're not purely engineering, uh, they really truly are a hybrid of both. So when we start to look at an NBF or shoreline techniques, the first thing we need to do is assess our shoreline. Uh, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly important to assess the physical forces that act on your shoreline to determine the best possible treatment. And oftentimes we look at those physical forces first because those are often uh, the forces that are most detrimental to our shoreline or, or that cause degradation to our shoreline. The reality is that here in Michigan, most of those forces tend to come from waves and from ice. We may get other uh, or impacts from other sources, such as human use, runoff, uh, pollution, things like that. But most of the time, we're really talking about waves and ice as being the most destructive forces acting on our shorelines. And to boil it down even further, what a lot of uh, our shoreline degradation really comes down to is wave height. So we're gonna spend a little bit of time here talking about waves and where they come from and how they interact with our shorelines. So to do the, these assessments right, we need to be able to combine our desktop analysis with site observations. And it's really important that you don't overly weight one or the other of those. Uh, you really need to use all of the tools that are available to you. And when we're assessing a shoreline, we're looking at 
not just water, not just plants, but a little bit of everything. We're looking at vegetation, soils, water, and waves. And then something that, that, that we kind of have missing here is, is human use patterns too, because there, there is a reality and, it, and it's only becoming uh, more so these days is we are loving our shorelines to death. Boat activity and development and things like that very much do affect our shorelines. So in the process of assessing and designing shoreline techniques, we need to use all of these techniques that are available. And we don't have enough time today, this afternoon, to go into the details of all of these different things. Uh, but I, I'll put in a plug if you attend the Shoreline Partnership uh, uh, training course, uh, we'll actually get into detail and teaching about a lot of these different things. But we, we do use calculations and worksheets and observations, but then we also need to use anecdotal information because sometimes for, for things like boat traffic, wake boats and things like that, there's no calculation or worksheet that's going to be able to tell you how people are using boats on a given lake. So sometimes we need to tap into local residents that, to, to really get their information for, for how people are using the lake and, and make, make sure that that's incorporated into our designs. And really the take home message here is no one tool is ever sufficient. And I've, I've personally had lots of different cases where uh, either overly relied on site observations or calculations or anecdotal information. And by overly weighting one of those factors actually missed out on some key factors uh, that influenced a shoreline uh, and wound up affecting the design. So when we're looking at shorelines, we assess erosion potential. And again, erosion being one of the most significant forces that does act on our shorelines. So the most frequent factors, the most common factors that we look at are the presence or absence of aquatic plants, the orientation to, orientation to prevailing winds, we look at lake bathymetry, and that lake bathymetry, we, we look at the bottom contours and the shoreline run-up. We look at the lake shape, and then we look at the lake fetch. And that bathymetry, shape, and fetch, as well as prevailing winds, what all of that really leads to is analysis of waves and, and how those and, and what size waves may wind up interacting with your shoreline. So diving into that a little bit further. What is a wave? Uh, it sounds elementary, but it's really not, especially if you talk to a physicist. Uh, a wave is a swell in a body of water, typically with some kind of forward motion. So a wave is created by energy passing through water. And this is something that's really important is that a wave, a wave is a transfer of energy. It's not actually a transfer of water itself. So when we think about it, wave energy is actually just a form of solar energy. What happens if you uh, is the sun's rays are transmitted to the earth because of the water and land that we have on the earth, we, we get uneven heating. That uneven heating creates wind uh, in the form of wind energy. That wind energy is then transferred to the water, which then creates waves. So through that transfer of energy, waves are really just just solar energy. So we see <clears throat> wave origins really coming from three different places. First being wind driven, uh, the second being gravitational or tides, uh, and the third being disturbance driven. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about wind driven and disturbance driven waves here. We really don't get gravitational uh, uh, or, or tide driven waves uh, here in the Midwest. We do get in Great Lakes influenced areas, so what we call a seiche, which is something that some people kind of consider a Great Lakes tide, although it's not a true tide. Uh, but really we're gonna focus more on wind driven and disturbance driven waves here. So what happens with wind driven waves is anytime two molecules pass each other, there is friction created. So when wind passes across a water body, that friction starts to create what we would think of as micro whipple, micro ripples, which is that friction starting to, to pass its energy onto the wave. As those micro ripples start to, to form and you get, then you start to get more friction. 
So the longer that wind passes across the wave, the more friction is created from both a distance and a duration standpoint. So those micro ripples turn into larger ripples. Those ripples that, which then turn into a chop and then that chop will turn into fully developed waves. So all of that, all of that wind energy is just friction passing onto the waves and it becomes a snowball effect where the longer and harder the wind blows, the bigger those waves get from that, from purely that, that friction. So our wave height winds up being a function of our fetch, which is the longest duration or the longest uninterrupted distance across a water body from your site, wind speed, uh, wind duration, and then the water depth. Then we talk about boat-driven waves, and boat-driven waves are, are displacement waves. So what happens, and boat-driven waves are becoming more and more of a problem on our lake shores, especially as wake boats are becoming more common because wake boats are quite literally designed to create maximum wave heights. And the science and technology of the of some of these wave boat, wake boats are amazing, but these boats are actually designed to where they can produce larger waves than naturally occurring wind driven waves. So what happens with a boat driven wave is that the boat displaces water. Uh, and, and that really comes down to the boat hull displacing water. So then in that case, the wave height is actually a factor of the boat shape as well as the boat speed. Now, an important and interesting note to make here is that if we look at our little graph here, the wave height will increase with boat speed to a point. Uh, boaters might use the term plowing water, and that's when a boat's gaining speed, but it's not planing above the water's surface. So your maximum wave height comes when the boat speed is just off of planing because that's when it's quote unquote plowing or pushing the most amount of water, which then creates our highest waves along our lake shores. But then once that boat gets, gets up above the water surface and starts planing, some people might call that on step, then your wave height's actually reduced. So what we see with these boat driven waves is those waves might be periodic, uh, but, but typically more intensive when they occur. So you're not going to have you, you know, a, a four hour, uh, uh, say, boat wave event like you would with a storm. But when those boats do come, say, during an intense, you know, uh, intensely used day on a July afternoon and Saturday, uh, those wave heights can be pretty significant and you can have very much have a negative effect on our shorelines. So this wave height comes again from all of these different factors. Uh, uh, considering both wind-driven waves and our boat-driven waves. And what we find is that that wave height is typically limited either by fetch or by depth. And the reason for that is this principle that waves are going to break up and lose energy when the wave height is 80% of the water depth. So if we look at our little surfer dune, what happens is uh, the, the steeper the slope of your shoreline, the closer to the shoreline that wave is going to be. So we, right now we're at our steep uh, slope. And when you have a steep slope, that wave's not going to break until you get right onto the shoreline itself. Whereas if we let things cycle through again, with a gentle slope, that wave is going to break offshore. And then when that break, when that wave finally gets to the shoreline itself, it's just going to kind of slosh back and forth. So this is a really important principle when we talk about assessing wave energy, but also wave height, because that steeper slope on your shoreline is going to lead to deeper water, which then is going to lead to higher waves. Whereas if you have a gentle slope and shallower water, generally speaking, you're gonna have smaller waves and those waves are going to break further offshore. So I like to use these kind of, these two pictures here to kind of demonstrate this principle. 
uh, the picture on the top left, that was taken during a storm in December. This is on Muskegon Lake. Uh, the lake had about a four mile fetch. But here we have a, we, here we have a seawall in front of a, a house. Because of that seawall, water levels are fairly deep uh, out in front of this shore, uh, this particular shoreline. So those waves never broke. So what happened is in this case, we had about four to five foot waves coming across the lake. And because they never had the opportunity to break, all of that energy hits that seawall all at once. And what happens then in this particular case is these waves were actually throwing organic debris onto rooftops, not only on, on the houses along the lakeshore, but they were finding debris on houses across the street from where the storm was occurring. The picture on the bottom right, I took during a similar storm but this is Lake Michigan and Grand Haven where I live. And on this particular day, they were recording 20 to 25 foot waves in Lake Michigan, but those waves were breaking about 100 to 150 yards offshore because of, of this very gentle slope that we had. So while we had very big extreme waves out offshore, by the time you got to the shoreline itself, you could walk along that shoreline and the waves would just kind of slosh back and forth across your ankles because all of that energy has been dissipated offshore as opposed to into the near shore area. So that helps demonstrate really just how important that slope is. So considering this kind of kind of introduction uh, uh, to wave energy a little bit, we, then we start talking about how does that wave energy actually degrade our shorelines? Well, for one, just pure soil erosion. Those waves can can wash away soil, and we need soil for for plants to grow. Right, right, right. That's that's erosion. So then, those waves can actually physically displace the plants themselves when you get that much energy. The third part of it. So both of those are kind of no brainers. But the third part of it that we don't often think about is, especially in clay based systems. Continued wave energy can cause turbidity because it cause, can, causes continual resuspension of fine sediments. And in this picture in the bottom right, this is, this is a picture I took in Lake Erie. Uh, we had very, very high turbidity. And because of that high turbidity, even in calmer, shallower areas, aquatic vegetation just simply would not grow. And that's because we had a lot of clay, a lot of fine particles, and continued resuspension of those particles uh, from wave energy. So a couple of different ways here that waves interact with our shorelines. Uh, these are graphics that were put together by the Tip of the Mint Watershed Council, so credit goes to them. Uh, when you have a seawall, and, and and going back to this principle and what we were just talking about, how all of that wave energy has to go somewhere. Well, when we have a seawall, that wave energy goes a couple of different places. First of all, it can get directed toward the flanks. So that energy in this case is direct, all directed sideways. And if you have a neighbor that has a seawall and you don't, then you wind up receiving all of that reflected or refracted uh, wave energy, which can then direct that energy and cause erosion in the in the unprotected areas next to that seawall. And then here's what happens from a cross-section standpoint is that wave energy goes sideways, but it also goes downward. And when you have a seawall and that energy and that wave gets directed downward, then you start to have scour form out in front of that seawall. And what happens then is you have more energy in, in front of that seawall you have deeper water depths, which then limits the establishment of, of aquatic vegetation, but then you all that energy also dis, dis, or displaces aquatic vegetation. So by hardening our shorelines and putting in these vertical structures, uh, uh, all of that wave energy, instead of being attenuated, becomes reflected and refracted, and then causes erosion and, and limits the establishment of vegetation on our shoreline. Whereas when we have naturally occurring shorelines, kind of like what we've talk, been talking about here, those waves can break. That sediment might move around in what we might call a state of dynamic stability, but, but we wind up with an overall 
more stable uh, and more ecologically friendly shoreline. Because when we're talking about our aquatic nearshore areas, where our best habitat is, it is typically where we're able to grow plants. So we take this knowledge of, of waves and how waves interact with shorelines, be it boats, human development, things like that. And we start to think about design. And what we do when we're designing our designing natural shorelines is we try to look at existing naturally occurring stable shorelines and study those characteristics of natural shorelines to then use those as clues from a biological and a physical standpoint to help aid us in our designs. So a resilient natural shoreline typically has those physical and biological characteristics that create stability under a variety of these different climate driven conditions. And typically this is gonna be stability at both low and high water conditions. And that goes for whether you're inland or if you're in Great Lakes coastal areas. These, tip, these areas typically have a stable form and function, but that does not mean unchanging. And this is really important to take note of is that we have this term that we use called dynamic stability. And that's that these shorelines are changing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that they stay the same. And this is the difference between using natural shorelines and using straight engineered structural shorelines is engineers typically design shorelines to be immovable, to stay locked in place. And when we're utilizing these natural and nature-based principles, we're saying some movement is okay as long as it's dynamic stability. So some of the things that we look at in these two pictures here, I, I took both of these at Great Lakes uh, uh, open coastal areas. The top is Sheboygan State Park. The bottom right is Leelanau State Park. So these are big open coastal wetlands where, where, where we have naturally occurring natural shorelines and wetlands. So some of the common factors that we find in these natural stable shorelines are gentle slopes. So generally, 10 to one to 20 to one. So that's 10 feet of horizontal distance to one foot of vertical distance to 20 to one. We typically see layers of vegetation. So not just one vegetation type, but shrubs and bulrushes and grasses. These areas are dynamic and transient. So any rock and cobble that's there might move around a little bit. They're not always purely vegetated, but they'll have you know some vegetation that might come and go. And they have these mosaics. So we use these areas as templates to start to understand how to design and restore shorelines. What our techniques really come down to is what we might consider to be a continuum of choice. And this is an important point is that when we're talking about restoring shorelines, especially in the face of human impact and human development, we are not often talking about pure ecological solutions. What we're usually seeing is a continuum. On one side, the far bioengineered side of things, we're really talking about native plants and natural materials. The other side of the spectrum, that's structural engineering. That's when we're designing seawalls or heavy armor stone or things like that. But a lot of our, our shoreline projects wind up occurring somewhere in the middle. And a term that we can use for that sometimes is biotechnical engineering. And that biotechnical engineering is, is where we're hybridizing these solutions, where we might be using some rock, uh, almost always utilizing native plants in some way, shape, or form, and then biodegradable erosion control materials. So, so we're trying to establish vegetation, utilize those natural materials to for both stability and habitat but then also sometimes adding that extra muscle that's needed to, to be able to protect infrastructure or protect against things like, like boat-driven waves. So some of the design considerations that we look at, we want to look at site location and conditions. What kind of infrastructure is being protected if any infrastructure is being, but the, the, the techniques that you choose might be different if you're trying to protect a million dollar home or a wastewater treatment plant versus uh, minimizing erosion at a nature preserve. 
but you assess what level of risk is actually ac acceptable. Uh, what happens if you get a complete failure? Uh, are you going to lose a road or a home or is there potential harm to human life? Or, or do you potentially uh, uh, just have some continued erosion and maybe you don't have that level of risk? So you ask yourself, is a dynamic or changing shoreline acceptable or is it not? Uh, are there any special ecological or cultural considerations? Do you have protected species? Do you have regulated wetlands along your shoreline? Uh, do you have special human use factors? Do you have social or cultural factors? Do you have historic buildings and structures either that need to be maintained or, or that need to, uh, uh, that you need to be mindful of in designing in the aesthetics of your specific shoreline? You also want to look at what are the short and long-term resources that are available? Uh, does your particular project, your particular community, are they able to get a grant to do the work? And then do they have resources to install, to maintain that property after that initial grant funding is gone? Because oftentimes the difference between a successful and unsuccessful project isn't the original design, it's how it's maintained afterwards. Uh, so getting an understanding of the resources that an individual or a community has is really important. Uh, and, and oftentimes we'll change designs around those available resources. Then the last thing to be considered uh, that always needs to be considered is regulatory concerns. Uh, is your pro project permittable? Because shorelines are almost all, almost always occur in areas that are regulated by the state of Michigan and or the United States Army Corps of Engineers. And you need to be mindful of all of those regulations that might influence what you do on your shoreline. So a little bit different way of looking at, at shoreline techniques, and this is something that, that we're kind of borrowing from stream principles a little bit, is broadly lumping our techniques into what we think of as form-based solutions and process-based solutions. So form-based solutions are typically going to be more engineered solutions, and those are going to be designed around static or set conditions. So even though we might have nature-based principles or adding ecological elements to these sites, uh, these form-based solutions uh, are typically going to be fo focused much more on static stability as opposed to dynamic stability. So we might have a rock toe that's designed to not move, but then we layer some native plants into that project. On the other side of the coin are what we would consider to be process-based solutions. These process-based solutions understand that shorelines are naturally transient and dynamic. Shorelines are going to move, rock might move around a little bit, plants might move around a little bit, just like they do in natural systems. And we go into the design of these systems saying all of that movement, that's okay. So with these principles and, and ideas of assessment in mind, we're gonna take a step through some different techniques that we actually use uh, in, in actually stabilizing our shorelines. On the softest end of our spectrum, uh, we're typically talking about vegetative techniques. This is a project, this is actually one of the demonstration projects for the Natural Shoreline Partnership. In this case, we use nothing but native plants and 100% biodegradable materials. So what you see here is that's a core log, 100% uh, coconut material, it'll all degrade over time that's placed along the lake shore, along with biodegradable erosion control fabric and everything's planted. Now, what's really important to keep in mind when we're utilizing techniques like that core log is all of that biodegradable material is going to degrade at some point. So your ultimate technique is only going to be as good as the plants that are left in place to be able to stabilize that shoreline. So here's that shoreline afterward. What you see is a, is a wide variety of native sedges, rushes, grasses, and forbs uh, really counting on those root systems to protect that shoreline in the long term, create habitat while also stopping erosion uh, once, all that, once all that coconut material has gone away. This is another site. This is a case where we actually did nothing more than 
braid the shoreline. So talking about that principle of gentler slopes, uh, in this case, in this area, it actually gets about three feet, three foot waves. We graded the entire shoreline back to a 10 on one slope and then just planted it. And what we see here is vegetation. This is actually at low water. This is a site that's under the influence of Lake Michigan water levels. And you can see the marina nearby with the boat center right there. Then as the water levels come up, the shoreline changes, the shore, the water advances land, landward, you lose some of those more facultative species, the emergent species and submergent species start to take hold. So the shoreline has changed, but it's still stable, both at low and high water periods. Another element that we can use from a vegetative standpoint is utilizing woody habitat structure. So this is a case where we had uh, these steep, eroded, undercut banks. In this case, a lot of this was coming from boat traffic. Uh, this is a county park in Ottawa County. You, you see these roots that are exposed, cut off and undercut banks. So in this case, what we had on the shoreline were a lot of dead ash that had been killed off from emerald ash border. So we went in, we cut down those trees, laid those trees down uh, uh, in a direction perpendicular or, or, or per perpendicular to the waves that were hitting the shoreline and then planted vegetation. And what those trees do is they create a significant amount of submerged habitat. They also create that near shore habitat for, for turtle basking and things like that. They naturally capture sediment. So you can see that sand is starting to build up and naturally repair the shoreline. And then, it, and then it gives you that protection that allows for, for wetland vegetation, in this case, shrubs. And then you see these uh, white water lilies established in the near shore area. Another technique, kind of a hybrid technique that we can use is called joint planting. And this technique really is modeled around some of our natural cobble shorelines. So again, this is Leelanau State Park, a uh, big wide open wetland. And if you were to go out, out there, what you would see is a combination of sloped cobble with shrubs. And the cobble gives, it moves around a little bit. It's a gentle, gentle slope. It gives those, those shrubs an opportunity to get established and then spread during both low and high water periods. So we take that and we mimic it. We, we look at our site constraints. We size our rock appropriately using smallest rock possible. A term that we're starting to use for this is, is also dynamic revetment. Uh, uh, it's kind of a, a new buzzword that's being used. So here we see our sloped rock. Uh, you know, if you are a turtle or a frog or a bird, that's much more friendly for being able to pass back and forth from the land to the water. Uh, we get our shrubs established. And then a year later, those shrubs, those shrubs start to get established behind the rock. What happens on a site like this is then once those plants are established, then they use the protection afforded them by that rock to start to creep out uh, lakeward and, and toward the lake. Bioengineered lifts is another technique that we can use. Uh, this is a little bit more of a form-based technique. Uh, so in this case, what we do is we, we construct a rock toe where we have a little bit higher wave energy. We actually wrap soil into these, what we call lifts. And that soil is that, and then we layer native seed and native plants into each layer of that wrapped soil that's built up on top of that rock toe. The rock toe can be variably sized with different heights and different rock, uh, uh, rock sizes, depending on the wave energy that the shoreline gets. Uh, but then, and this is a different site, but this is the same technique established about 10 years later. So this is a case where we essentially built a shrub wall. And what you wind up with is, is kind of a, a, a green living wall. The site gets three to four foot waves at, at, at the highest, so it can handle some pretty big energy. But there you see all of that, all of those overhanging shrubs. So you're creating shade, you're creating uh, uh, protection, you're utilizing those native plant roots to really lock in and bind that soil in the long term. And then we can do other things where we can creatively, 
you know, if we have big high energy, uh, we, we can use the rock in different creative ways. So here uh, we, we actually designed in gaps into this larger boulder, these larger boulders. And what those gaps do is they give you, they give wildlife passage back and forth between the land and the water, but they also allow for places for vegetation to get established. So what you see is once, in this case, the soft stem bulrush starts to get established, then it uses those prote those protections and those protected areas to be able to creep out onto the lake bed. So oftentimes in these higher energy areas, the plants can persist once established, but that establishment period is what's really difficult and really crucial. So they need a little bit of an assist to be able to get established and, and then the plants will creep out on their own. So I'm gonna let, use the last few minutes here to talk a little bit about a decision support tool that we're currently developing. And the decision support tool is going to take everything that we just talked about and a lot more and, and uh, ultimately be a tool that's gonna be publicly available that will aid users in the selection of these natural and nature-based techniques. So we're currently developing two of these, one for the state of New York, and we're also developing one for the state of Michigan. We're working closely with uh, uh, the Water Resources Division of Michigan, uh, working with in both Inland Lake staff as well as coastal management staff. So does the decision support tool, it's going to be an educational tool that provides users with NNBF alternatives for a given site. What we're trying to do with this tool is fill a gap that exists between really detailed, complex design level guidance and overly simplified high level guidance. So if you look at information that's out there, you know, a lot of what's out there is really detailed design calculations and things like that, that, that you know, that might take an engineering degree to understand how to use. Uh, the other side of that is you get fact sheets or things like that, perhaps that are so oversimplified that they don't wind up being terribly useful to inform design. So we're developing this tool that uses what we call kind of a semi-quantitative logic that builds in en those engineered calculations, but does it in a way that is a fairly simple and nimble to use tool. The early version is going to be a spreadsheet-based tool. Uh, we hope to get that released within Michigan by the end of this year, uh, with the hope that eventually, the intent that eventually that will be a web-based tool. And for the state of New York, we've completed the spreadsheet-based tool, and we expect to launch the web-based version of that uh, at the end of 2024 here. So what the spreadsheet-based tool is going to have, and we'll dive into this in a little bit more detail, is a series of inputs and a series of outputs. The inputs are going to be user-driven, and they're going to be based on the series of site parameters that we've determined are really the most critical ones that guide design. They're not everything, but what we wanted to do is try, try to develop a tool that was useful, but still nimble. Uh, when we first started brainstorming these, we came up with 30 or 40 different parameters that could be used. And the reality is it's not practical to expect somebody to be able to use that tool uh, uh, in, in fairly short order without having to go through extensive training. So right now, the inputs that we have, uh, and, and these still may change, but, but they're likely going to be something like this uh, for the Michigan tool are going to include location shoreline type. So in this case, we're talking about a sand and cobble shore, uh, critical structure setback, design wave height, ice duration, shoreline length, project area slope, shoreline width, and then bank height. So, you know, as, as everything that we were just talking about, those are the main physical factors that interact with the shoreline. And using either drop-down menus or uh, uh, user-defined inputs just by punching in numbers, uh, the tool will, will analyze all of those factors. And then from an ecological and a regulatory concern, 
we also uh, have cues to to the user for critical dune areas and regulated wetlands and and high risk erosion areas, as well as protected species and floodplains and things like that. So the outputs as of right now that are in the Michigan based tool are going to be structure or relocation or structure relocation or raising vegetative techniques, large woody habitat structures, biotechnical techniques, shoreline grading and sloping, bluff grading and sloping, monitor and maintaining and protecting natural areas. And each of these outputs will be tied to fact sheets that will be available that will then give the user more detailed information about the use of that technique. So this is what the spreadsheet tool is going to look like. Here you see these different outputs and, and uh, the recommended strategies are gonna occur across a gradient. So we're gonna have either not recommended, low suitability, moderate suitability, or high suitability uh, for each of these techniques. So in this case, if the user put in their, their defined inputs, uh, then they would be kicked out several potential techniques that would be suitable for their site. And then those would will all be linked to different fact sheets. And these will be two, two to four page fact sheets, which will then give more detailed information to the user about how to actually apply that technique to their given shoreline. We will also have these cues uh, that will guide the user toward potential permits that will be needed uh, for any in order to install their given project. So how the logic works, again, it's semi-quantitative. So we do have engineered calculations utilizing traditional coastal engineering calculations built into the tool that analyze the wave height and the slope, uh, as, well, as well as the kind of utilizing these, these drop-down menus for things like ice, where we ask the user to look at you know, how often is ice a problem? Is it constantly a problem or is it rarely a problem? Uh, so utilizing all of these different factors to, in aggregate, it's going to cue the user toward those techniques. The challenges with this tool in part is that the data does not always exist to quantify these NNBF practices. These are relatively new practices. There's a lot of work being done right now so a lot of this logic is being built on collect collective practitioner experience. And what, we've, what we're really fortunate that we've been able to do is because we've been developing these tools for both the state of New York and the state of Michigan, we have stakeholder groups and practitioners for both, for both states that are, that are providing input based on their project experience. So both states are benefiting off of each other and that collective experience in order to uh, help us make the tool be as robust and as accurate as possible. So we're hoping to be going into a, uh, a testing and revision process here in 2024. Uh, 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 and some of you uh, in this webinar actually may wind up being involved with, with some of that testing. Uh, with the tool, we want to make sure that we walk the line between a decision support tool and a design tool, uh, which winds up being very tricky when we're developing this kind of quantitative or semi-quantitative tool. Uh, you know, the last challenge to, to mention here is NNBF practices are very complex and they're subject to not only physical forces, but also these biological forces. And natural forces can inherently be a bit unpredictable. We can't always predict wildlife usage or storm patterns or invasive species infestation. So, so that unpredictability can create challenges in the design and use of these techniques. So the next steps we mentioned, uh, the last thing that I'd like to put in here is a plug for the Certified Natural Shoreline Professional Training. Uh, we'll be host hosting the training at Stony Creek Metro Park uh, in March. If anybody here is interested in signing up, uh, you can go to the Michigan Shore Natural Shoreline Partnership website. That website is shoreline.org. Uh, 
It's going to be a two-day uh, classroom-based training in March. And then in late spring, early summer, we'll be hosting a field-based training there at Stony Creek Metro Park, where, where we will actually be installing uh, a natural shoreline. So we think it's important as part of the class that participants actually get out, get their hands dirty, and actually install one of these shorelines. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for your participation today. Uh, have time for some questions and answers. And if anybody's particularly interested, I would be glad to open up that Shoreline Decision Support Tool and we can give a little bit of a live demonstration. But otherwise, uh, uh, Elise, I'll kick it yeah. over to you for any yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was super interesting and we are really going to look forward to seeing that tool being launched and um, out there for public consumption. Um, I have three questions uh, that have been um, submitted and in reviewing them um, you could probably talk extensively on each of these so uh, mm -hmm. but we'll if you can uh, maybe just give a quick input um, with regards to each that would be great. Uh, the first uh, question refers to uh, a slide that was early in your presentation uh, that dealt with how does wave energy degrade shorelines? And um, the questioner specifically, I, sounds, I think maybe had a little bit of an issue with the word degrade and stated, can you speak to the other side of the coin of looking through the lens of how the process of wave energy through, erosion, through driving erosion and accretion are also natural inherent processes that uh, lakes and streams are supposed to have. So I think there's this uh, dichotomy between the naturally occurring processes and maybe the accelerated processes, um, maybe due to human factors. So throw it back to you for um, any input. Sure, and, and, and you're right. That, that could potentially be a very long-winded answer, so I'll try to keep it a little bit short. Mm -hmm. uh, Typically, when we see natural processes, we see a we see shorelines that may recede, but then also shorelines that may advance. And typically, that sediment movement and that sediment transport is going to occur in some kind of balance. So what is equally eroded is also accreted or is also aggraded. And that may change over time as water levels go up and down. Or, or, or wave energies and shorelines move, but you wind up with a system that's overall in balance where erosion and accretion or aggradation are relatively equal. Where you get a system that may be out of balance is when, you know, human development or uh, 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 be it through use of shoreline or hardening of shorelines, or increased wave activity through things like boat waves mean that there's more erosion and you don't get accretion. So what you wind up with is actually long-term shoreline recession and actually loss of shorelines and loss of the ecological habitat that makes up those shorelines. So basically converting uh, that wetland and near shore habitat into open lake bottom where, where plants can no longer become established. Um, okay, the second question um, on a completely different topic is how do you, and this is also probably another whole talk in itself, but how do you prevent invasive plants from establishing while waiting for uh, native plants to take hold and spread through shoreline restoration? Very careful maintenance. <laughs> yes. uh, you, you know, where soil and water meet creates an opportunity for all kinds of plants to grow, especially opportunistic invasive. So, so uh, it's pretty common that projects that have failed have been ones where people put in the ground and walked away. So you really need to plan for maintenance, especially in the short term, but also in the long term, because when you have a brand new open earth or newly established site, you don't have native plants established. That's a, that's a prime place for invasive plants to get established. So oftentimes the maintenance, uh, it may include hand pulling, it might include invasive or uh, herbicide treatments uh, or, or other ways of, of weeding out that invasive species. 
those invasive species, but you really do need to plan for that from the onset of the project. Yeah, and definitely have um, the owner or whoever's doing it know what they're looking at too, so they are pulling yeah. out the right plants. Um, okay, last question um, is from a participant here who has a cabin on a, a lake north of Petoskey, mm -hmm. and he it sounds like he is anxious to find someone to use nature-based solutions, and how, how do you find someone who can start to implement some of these solutions and has access to plants and related material? So through the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership, we have trained nearly three or nearly 400 individuals and contractors uh, uh, since the inception of the program back in 2009. And on our website, we actually have a list of active and certified contractors. So, so if you go to the short, that website, shorelinepartnership.org, you actually have access to anybody who's been through that program and wants to be listed on the website. And we did that intentionally to, to try to, to, to meet the needs of landowners exactly like, like this individual to help pair them up with trained contractors that can potentially help them out with their shorelines. That's, that's awesome. Um, that is the last question that's been submitted, um, and we are at uh, one minute before 4.30, so I don't know if you have time to do a one-minute <laughs> demonstration or if we should wrap it up at this point. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, I can do a little demonstration, but won't be offended if people decide that they want to jump off. How about that? Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone who has uh, joined us today and um, keep uh, keep your eyes open for future webinars. Uh, and do we love um, presenting this information to all of you and look forward to um, your participation in the future. So, all right, back to you, Brian. All right, we'll see who the, the hardcore late Friday crowd is here. Yeah. <laughs> So this is, that's the wrong tool, let me pull up the Michigan tool. Give me just a second here. I pulled up the wrong tool. So this is the current draft of the Michigan, uh, we call it coastal, but it's actually been adapted to include both inland and Great Lakes. So if we go through the drop-down menus here, first choice will be, is your site on an inland lake or is it on a Great Lake? The shoreline types, these are based uh, roughly around Michigan Natural Features inventory shoreline types. So we have bedrock cliffs and shores, sand and cobble shore, dune and beach, coastal wetland. And then we also have hardened or artificial and turf and managed landscapes, understanding that there are developed shorelines that, that uh, don't fit into these neat boxes of our naturally occurring shorelines. We have design wave height. We intentionally do not tell the user how, what wave height to choose, uh, but there will be some guidance in, in selection of that. But ultimately that's up to the user to choose. We have wave height, or we have ice duration. We have length, shoreline length, project area slope, width and bank height. So what you see here if you look, if you go back to our discussion of slope uh, and how important slope is, what you'll see here is if we make the slope steeper, we're going to see more techniques drop out. And we again, we, we designed this tool to try to make it fairly nimble, but in this case, with a two foot high wave height, if we make our slope gentler, the gentler we make it then the more techniques we see become available to us. 
at the same time, we've also created a lower bounding. So if your shoreline has very low energy to it, we are not recommending any kind of rock-based techniques because with very low energy, vegetation alone should suffice. So we're not only looking at the high end of the spectrum, we're also looking at the low end of the spectrum to make sure that, that uh, users are utilizing hopefully the softest possible techniques that will still protect the shoreline. So as we, and as we get into our great big techniques, then you see at some point with really big waves, your only solutions may be these biotechnical techniques or getting out of the way. But when you're in that middle ground, you know, say with a two foot or a one and a half foot wave, if you can, and you have a steep slope on your shoreline, what this might tell you is if you take your shoreline from a two on one slope to an eight on one slope, then all of a sudden, things like woody structures and low energy techniques become available to you. So we've designed the tool in a way that can be very nimble. Uh, we want people to be able to just play around with these parameters. Uh, so, you know, it's geared toward a private landowner or somebody that works on a municipal shoreline, but at the same time, it has baked in engineered calculations into it. So it's useful uh, for actual uh, design as well. So then again, going to these techniques, each of these techniques is going to be paired up with a fact sheet that will then give that more detailed information on the selection of and design of those different practices. So, we have a lot of different things baked into the what we call the logic or the algorithms of the tool. But ultimately, techniques are recommended based on this combination of shoreline type, all of these different physical factors, and location being on either an inland lake or a great lake. So I'll pause there and see if anybody has any questions or anything that you guys might like to uh, discuss or you, you'd like to learn a little bit more about with uh, with this tool. Okay, um, I, I don't see any new questions. So uh, I guess maybe we'll leave it at that. All right. And yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it was really nice actually to see all those photos of summer days at the shoreline. Um, take care, I mean, everyone. Oh, were you going to say something? Oh, I, I was just going to say, you know, on these cold, gray January days, we're, we're dreaming of those, yes. those warm days on the lake shore, right? I know it. No kidding. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up, everyone. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Take care.